Dear Charlotte von Lossdorf, recently in Berlin, I visited your museum. My, my childhood friend, John Marks, and I, we were astounded, awestruck, about your furniture collection and your astounding array of its photographs. But I must confess, I was equally impressed by the mere fact of your survival. <laughs> I grew up gay in the Bible Belt. I can only imagine what it must have been like under the Third Reich. I mean, first the Nazis and, and then the Communists. It seems to me that you're an impossibility. You shouldn't even exist. And so here's the presumptuous part of my letter. Um, I would love the opportunity to continue to study about your life and all that. And we write a play about you. Now, with your support, I can apply for funding, fly back to Berlin, and begin working in earnest. And as far as grant applications go, forgive me. But for my eyes, you're a slam dunk. Now, even if you reject my proposal, please know that that morning we spent with you was one of the most memorable of my life. Thank you for your kind attention. I look forward to hearing from you. Sincerely, Doug Wright. Dear Mr. Wright, yes, perhaps you could make a play about me. Would it be possible for you to visit Berlin after Christmas? Sincerely, shall not have my Testing, testing, one, two, three. Uh, take one. I am heading to the Grundesite Museum in Malsdorf for my first official interview with Charlotte von Malsdorf. And with me, John Marks. Uh, John. Could you ask Charlotta, what was her given name? Her birth name, legal name? Mosbar Ira Gebertsnam. Nice Gebertsnam, Valotta, Lotta Bethel. It was Lofa. Yeah, about that. Um, and now could you ask her when, when exactly, that she knew that her name should be Charlotte? Von Gossen sie das ihre Name Charlotte sein Sohn Zigzinger? I can tell it in English, yes? <laughs> <laughs> It's hard to believe, sir, but she worked on an estate in eastern Russia, yeah? But ever since she was 15 years old, she did not wear ladies' clothes or only boots and jackets, yeah? And she was working there on a large farm raising horses. And in uh, August of 1943, I came to visit her, yeah? And when I did, I looked in her closet, and there are girls' clothes. And so, I tried them on. And then my tante was coming into the room, and she looked at us in the mirror, and she said, Nice to meet this body, that's the mentor at Ancheselab. Do you know that nature has dared to play a joke on us? You should have been born a girl, and I a man. And then, my aunt, she took out a book from the bookcase. And it had this blue binding, and I turned to the title page. And it was here. And he said, the chance has beaten. Magnus Hirschberg, 
but I swear to be a But I thought the shiva dollars behind. Yeah. Anyway, uh, my Tante Louise, she said, read. In each person, there exists a delicate balance of male and female substances. And just as we can't find two matching leaves on the same tree, it is scientifically impossible to find two human beings whose male and female characteristics match in kind and number. With you read. Uh, and so we must treat sexual intermediaries, those individuals who define the rate classification of man or woman, as a common, utterly natural phenomenon? Yes. And the Patanta said, and this book is not just any book. This book, it will be your Bible. Look and say, I'll pass this book. Now, I just slipped into the kitchen. Uh, I brought a camera, but I'm a little too shy to use it. I, I don't want her to think that I'm gawking, but I do want to record an impression, visual impression. Uh, she's about 5'8", 175 pounds, 65 years old, and doesn't look like a drag queen at all. She doesn't wear makeup. I asked her about that. She said, she doesn't need it. She has piercing eyes, really smart eyes. And she has a crooked little smile, and then her, her hair. She wears it natural. It's, it's a white, goose kind of white. She wears a kind of a, a page boy cut. And she wears a string of pearls, has a dress, and uh, heavy shoes, orthopedic shoes, I think. She doesn't have breasts, uh, just sort of enough posh to enhance the impression. But her hands. Her hands are, are they're like the hands of a woodworker or a craftsman. Definitely a man's hands. <laughs> the hardest time for me was near the end of World War II, when I was wandering about and but I didn't have a uniform, and I didn't carry a weapon. I just had my brown hair, it was long and flowing, and, and I wore my mother's house coat, and I had the shoes of a girl, and we were what in Germany was called the Freiwillen, uh, like the Jews, we were by the game, yeah? And I was wandering through the streets, and by then, it was broken. And he made us run everywhere from all the houses. I turned the corner. And that is coming, the Russian airplanes, with the shrapnelers. And, and they were so close, you could see the, the pilot and the helmet and the goggles. And, and there were bombs and they were dropping everywhere. And you see, this is very dangerous because the shrapnelers, they go into the earth and explode. And you must get away because you cannot escape them otherwise. And on the corner, they were standing and the air shot. And so I went inside. I was there for about half an hour, and the lungs were falling, the walls were shaking, and suddenly came in four SS officers, infantry police, the kept on that. And they were looking for boys and men, and even older men, without weapons, who were hiding. And so they took us up to the police station, and they made me stand against the wall. They were standing just about four or five meters away. Our deserters will be shot! And they wanted to shoot me. But I didn't want to see myself being shot. And I figured I, I'll wait until I feel it. So I looked down. But when I did, I saw the shoes of a commander. He looked at me. Are you a boy or a girl? And I thought, what does it matter if I'm a boy or a girl? 
they shook me and I'm dead, dead is dead. Hey, <laughs> my boy. How old are you then? Sixteen. And he turned to the execution squad commander. We are not so far gone that we must shoot school, gentlemen. And this, this was my salvation. Please find your clothes. Two antique cylinders. Yeah, I found them. They're your favorite John Philip Sousa. I got um, a Capitan and Semper Fidelis. They're standard blue and emerald, so they should play under Edison's standard just fine. I, meanwhile, am listening to our interview tapes every chance I get. On the treadmill, in the car, I've also started reading the complete works of Magnus Hirschfeld, and I'm studying German history since the time of Wilhelm II. Still, all I can think about is the story of your life. I mean, you are teaching me a history I didn't know I had. Thank you. Tip 7, January 26, 1993. How do you think that should be spelled for me? Uh, the nickname for me? Thomas Alva Edison. Of course, you have a talking machine too. His was made of tin foil with a tiny stylus, but it's yours is a Sony microcassette recorder with voice activation and automatic playback. Hmm. <laughs> All right, now. Uh, Joanna's boyhood continued from last day. If I was a child, and before that, when I was a little baby, wait, wait do you stop a second? I'm not sure the batteries. Yes. When I was a child, and before that, a little baby. Yeah, all right. Uh -huh. My father was a Nazi. And he was a and he believed in militarism. And the years for my wife, over my marriage, she was a little more yeah. My mother, she had six child lessons. Uh, oh, man, bizarre. And she wanted to do books, yeah. And my tante, she said to me, if your father beats your mother one more time, she could die. fortunate for us that in 1943 the German government decreed that all mothers of children should evacuate Berlin because of the air raids. And so my mother and she took the children to my aunt's house. Yeah? And we stayed there. And she was lesbian and I was too, so we became very good friends. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so one day I was cleaning. I looked out the window and it was snowing. And then I saw through the snow there was coming a man. And I became very scared because I realized this was my father. And I came to the house. And he and my aunt, they had a very hard discussion. And she said, your wife really wants a divorce from you. And he, he took out his revolver and he said, I don't want to hear one more word from you or I will shoot. And then I got it. She took a revolver from her desk and she said, I want you out the door by the time I count three, otherwise I will shoot. And then she said, three. Through <laughs> 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 one door and it stuck in the next door. And my father, he went back to Berlin. <laughs> <laughs> and I asked my aunt about this, and she said, Yes, it's a shame. A shame I didn't kill him. <laughs> yeah. Then, in 1945, my mother received a letter saying that <coughs> our father was going to have uh, people staying at our house uh, because of all the bombings and religions who lost their houses. Yeah? And so I caught the train back to Berlin because. 
people rearrange furniture for the refugees, yeah? And I was coming into our house, and, and my father was still living there, of course, and it was on the uh, first or second day, no? Second week. No, it was the first week of February 1945, yeah? And my father, he says to me, now is the hour I must ask you. Are you for your mother or me? You stand with her or with me. And I thought, I'm only 15. Why do you treat your, my mother so poorly? And he said, I will shoot you down like a dog. And then I will go to Russia and I will kill your mother. And I will kill your sister and I will kill your brother. And then I knew that he would do this. Because of what my aunt said. Yeah. And then, at night, he locked me in my room. With a gay very tightly. And at night, the allied bombs were, were falling. And on the bed, I saw um, a large, oh, it's the little cooking, uh, bacon, you know, uh, it's a, uh, a rolling bed. Yeah. And I thought, well, I can use this as a weapon, I need to. But my father, he blocked me very tightly in the room. But even then, I had keys. <laughs> so I carefully unlocked the door. And I was going to, to leave. Yeah? The house is very dark. And my father, he was sleeping on the sofa in the dining room. Yeah? And he had. Uh, his gun was on this chair next to him. And then, then our clock, it was striking at home. We had the Westminster clock. And it, it was striking at home. And in that moment, I saw him reach for his gun. And I began to strike. Right! Strike! Turn it! Feel it! Go! Some sentences I can barely discern which word is a verb. And the vocabulary I'm learning is so specific. Uh, yesterday in German class, I made a complete fool of myself. The teacher, she asked us, make small talk? <laughs> and I, I froze. I, I couldn't think of a single thing. And, and finally, okay, I put a phrase together, some few words that I learned the night before. And, Hi, uh, ich bin dog, and ich trage schwarze Spitzunterwäsche. I am dog, and I'm wearing black lace panties. <laughs> <laughs> the class just stared at me. So <laughs> this one guy, Morris, he often take me shopping. <laughs> I don't know, maybe I should be reading something else. Well, dog. Take nine, March 5th, March 5th, 1993. Uh, guten Abend, Charlotte. Wie geht es dir? Wie geht es Ihnen? Uh, I'll go for it. Hi, 
Also mit dem Atem schauen lassen. Und den Atem. Um, ich äh, bin äh, Deutsch gelernt, äh, so äh, du äh, your fantastische Leben besser zu verstehen. Excuse me? <laughs> uh, yes, now we speak Deutsch. Oh, you're learning German. Uh, yeah, I guess, yeah. Um, uh, last time, I'll, I'll pace, I'll, and uh, um, you were in a singer hut. Oh, the you penitentiary in Taylor? Oh, nein. I was saved by a miracle, yeah? Run back. I was sitting in my cot. Yeah? And I was brushing my hair with an ivory comb from my tongue. And suddenly I heard the guard cry in the hallway. The Russians! They're flying over our roof! And it was true. And then suddenly the bombs were falling and the walls were shaking and, and they dissolved like, like sandcastles in the tide. And, and I heard the guard say, Run! And I packed my blanket. One I grabbed me a long clock. And I ran. I ran. I ran through the iron gates and out past the ruins of the old Jewish synagogue. And then I saw the big Russian tanks. And behind them, the horses with the painted wagons, the allies were coming to Berlin. Oh, and then there was the coach with the officers decorated, and the Russian soldiers, they were handing out loaves of bread to the people. Well, it was springtime, and the birds were singing in the trees. And it was an awful war. Come on, pick up, pick up, pick up, okay? Oh, come on. They have the room. You gotta fix that, John. John Mark's air ride. Pick up, pick up. Come on, come on, come on, pick up. You're gonna make me wait for the whole message? <laughs> All right, John. Let's... Oh, jeez. <laughs> come on! Come on, John, John. I'm, I'm trying to get a hold of you for two days now. John? Huh? John? Huh? Yeah, listen. Um, I've got a problem. I'm, my financing one out, my funding. Uh, so I'm going to have to cancel my main visit. But also I lost. Uh, I figured I could sell my car. Whoa, whoa. You ever heard of time zones? It's 4 fucking a.m. Yeah, well, see, the thing is, I got my car. I think I can sell it for about 3000 And I don't pay for about a month or so. It's like, whoa. Whoa, whoa, whoa. I'm gonna sell your car. Are you going whoopy? Well, listen, John, the thing is, she doesn't run a museum. She is one. I mean, the rarest thing in her collection isn't a grandfather clock or a Biedermeyer tall boy. It's her. So I, I'm just asking you if I can still make it in June, can I still sleep on your floor? <laughs>